And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Black and Blue Pod. I'm your host, Matt McLaughlin, joined alongside by Timmy Gorman, and we are going to be reevaluating NBA offseason moves, kind of circling back on some of the biggest transactions that occurred this past NBA offseason, basically asking, was this worth it for one team or not? Uh, I broke it down in eight moves into three tiers, and so I'm going to be bouncing the tiers off of Timmy and he's going to be giving his reactions to that. So, first tier. This is the top of the line start the getaway car because we just got away with robbery tier. No, the first one I had was the Philadelphia Sixers signing DeAnthony Melton, which for as us Sixers fans, it feels like it's been years since we've had any depth on the bench at least and Melton has really stepped up. He's been a steady double digit point guy dropped 33 against the Lakers a couple of weeks ago um and especially with Tyrese Maxey out Harden was out for multiple weeks like Melton has just been a guy uh that has really stepped up and has really showed that like Daryl Morey once again getting away with robbery uh per usual uh do you think that this this move belongs in this tier this this robbery tier or do you think that uh, do you want to keep going just to see if maybe some other ones will change your mind and maybe put them up there? Um, I think from a Philly fan's perspective, yeah, it does because, like you said, depth has been it uh, has been something that we have had issues with ever since we started this new playoff run era with Embiid. Um, and I think the Anthony Melton is everything we thought Josh Richardson was going to be two years ago. And That's good he had a little That's... bit of a slow start. And then I, when Maxi went down, I think it kind of woke him up and it was like, all right, well, we're going to need you now. And if he wasn't, if he didn't step up his game, the Sixers could be in a lot more trouble than they are. Um, it's to the point now where it's like, you know, he's hitting big shot after big shot. His three, his three point shot has been locked in for the last three weeks or so. He's a disruptor on defense. He's really quick on the um, on the perimeter, so you can stick him on most top notch guards. I'm not saying he's a like defensive player of the year candidate, but he's good, and you know he can create when he needs to off the dribble. He's just like a really good. He's almost like a better. He is a. I don't want to say a um, a juiced up version or like a, a superior version, but. He is a he's like a rock, he's like a faster, younger um version with a possible higher ceiling than Robert Covington. Yeah, I can see it. I was also thinking about like Spencer Dinwiddie, but with more defense. Yeah, I mean with a lot more defense. Yeah. <laughs> Spencer Dinwiddie can create a little bit better, but yeah, he's he gives us he gives us options and I just him and Maxi together in the same backcourt, just it could be trouble for opposing defenses with this speed just coming at you. Now, it'll be interesting to see how they're going to do this. Obviously, Shake's going to the bench. Did they do a three guard lineup? And no then, way. I, and I, I just, you know, I can't see it. So, is it he becomes the sixth man then? And, and that's how they, they do it is, is probably what, because you probably can't unfortunately go with the three guard lineup because you would just get murdered on the boards if it was just Tobias and Joel. So you need somebody else in there that, that helped Joel out. Um, and they have, you know, this fascination with PJ Tucker, um, which I don't think they seem to understand. Like they got PJ Tucker for the playoffs, not so he can average 30 minutes a game in the regular fucking season, regardless we were talking about that and like the gritty ads. He does have some things that bother me about him, but that's how I, I digress. We will the talk about that though, transaction. That will be mentioned later. The mountain thing though, is that he, he's just been, he has been way better the last couple of weeks than he was in the start. Because when we first got him, it's like, Oh yeah, I forgot about him. And what is, you know, what does he really bring in? But he was crucial to keep Easton in that game once on, on Christmas day against the Knicks. He was really big, even though we ended up losing. He he had a pretty good game against the Wizards. 
And that's just, he's just been there. He's been like a steady 12 to 15 points, a couple steals, like five rebounds, maybe a two or three assists. He's, he's like a mini stat stuffer and yeah. he's doing it all the right reasons. And I just can't wait to see him and Maxi together. Now the word on the street is that Maxi's coming back tomorrow. I've yeah, I, I think, of course, that is what I up. saw. It's what I read. It's what I heard. I think Shams yeah. Shams tweeted something out about Maxi, like expected um, to come back very soon. I forget if he mentioned a specific day or not. Uh, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Philadelphia 76ers guard Tyrese Maxey is set to return to the lineup as soon as Friday in New Orleans, sources tell The Athletic. Uh, so that could be a tough game for him to come back in. That's going to be a tough matchup. Damn, we're in New Orleans. Whew, that's a – I mean, they're they're playing better than most teams right now. That's a, that's a good game. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to take Maxey a couple weeks, I think, to get back into the groove of things. Hopefully nothing gets re-aggravated, knock on wood. Um, but, yeah, I just – in the playoffs especially, those two together. And, you know, what we gave up for them was, you know, I don't want to say it's nothing because I was I, – and this is why I say from a Sixers fan perspective, it's highway robbery. But from a Grizzlies fan perspective, it's just like, all right, well, we just gave you one of our, like, seven – depth pieces that we eventually we were either going to lose them for free or we had to go you know we had to give them up and we traded what david roddy and yeah and who um was that like another draft pick or like a no uh, what's his name um danny green oh that's right yeah i keep forgetting danny um, was on the sixers so i'm not gonna lie i, know, I do too <laughs> i they were interviewing him last week and that's the only reason i remember that like i was like good oh, shit and so I say that from the from the Grizzlies perspective because I remember I was watching the game last week. They just trucked the Suns. I mean, the Suns are in the, the midst of their own little mini downfall right now. And for the most of the fourth quarter, they had it was like the I don't want to say the scrubs, but it was it was it was the the players who don't get a lot of playing time because yeah, you don't have scrubs in your team when you're one of the best players. Let's put it that what best teams in the league. And David Roddy had like a like two to three minute stretch where he was like drilled a three, took one to the hole, got like an N one, and then he absolutely fucking posterized. Um, who I forget who it was, but it, it was somebody that uh, I would have to look up their name again. But um, yeah, I think I think for both sides, for the Sixers as a team that's been in contention for a long time, it feels like highway robbery because Melton can impact. And more uh, sooner compared to Roddy, whereas like Memphis is a very young team. It, even though they've been in the playoffs for the last few years, this is really the first season that they're one of the upper echelon teams in the West. Right. So Roddy can be a piece for them mo- moving forward. Um, next, just to kind of keep it moving. The only other uh, team in this tier, Sacramento, I just loved every Kings move that they did this offseason for like, the first time in my generation, this has been an offseason where I'm like, oh, my God, Sacramento really upgraded this offseason. Kevin Herter has been mm-hmm. one of the best acquisitions in Sacramento Kings history, averaging 15 points per game, 47 and a half field goal percentage, 40, 41.4% uh, three-point percentage, which is a career high. Keegan Murray's been not necessarily a, a huge impact rookie, but he's been a consistent rookie that can at least provide some size down low to help out Sabonis on the low blocks. And he's averaging 28 minutes per game. So, you know, he's getting the trust of the coaching staff and Malik Monk has just been a high flyer, high energy guy that really could have fit well on this year's Lakers team, ironically. And he's doing everything right with, with the Kings. Um, Mike Brown has just really turned that that team just into a a really offensive juggernaut so far. Defensively, that's going to be my biggest concern is how are they going to be able to hold up and are they going to be able to stay in this track meet with um with Dallas like on their tails? Cause that Dallas and Golden State behind Sacramento, Dallas is in the seventh seed entering tonight. 
Golden State is in the 10 seed entering tonight. Obviously, the staff injury is huge. Sacramento is sitting at the 6 seed. My biggest concern is, like, can a young team like Sacramento really hold that sh- – hold uh, these good times and keep the good vibes up throughout 82 games and throughout the second half stretch entering playoffs? Um so yeah, we were. I know we were both very happy about what Sacramento did this offseason. So I don't know if you want to spend too much time on it. I just, I think I'm finally happy for De'Aaron Fox because like so many people have like just jumped off the bandwagon, and then it was just like Halliburton this and Halliburton that, and obviously Halliburton's proving like why everyone loved him um, in Indiana. But I, you know, and they probably they got a lot of grief for that, but they did the right thing, and it was just like. Well, there's no way this is going to work to guys like someone's got to take the keys. And at this point we can probably get more for Halliburton than anything. And so they're like, what does the Aaron need to be successful? And outside of going to the get his, you know, his best friend and running mate from college and Malik Monk, it was like, well, let's get him a movable big guy who can also pass. And outside of Jokic, who's the best big man that can do that in the league. It's Sabonis. And hey. I, I remember we talked about going into this uh, going into the season, we talked about the Kings and how Sabonis, I think after the Sabonis trade, Fox jumped from like 21 points per game to like 28 points per game. His shooting percentages were increased across the board. And yeah, like you said, outside of Jokic, Sabonis is one of the best passing big men in the league. So I'm, I'm very happy for Sacramento. I just really hope that they get into the playoffs, not the play in. Because yeah, I have a feeling I, if I have a feeling if they get into the play in, they could easily get knocked out. And it's just like fuck. It's like another like gut punch. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And it's just like for years, you know, it's just bad ownership, bad GM work, just draft picks who just never lived up to it. You know, you you you, you have Tyreek Evans who has was like a one year wonder and then kind of just muddle, you know, his way through the league for the next like seven years. You take Boogie and he's good, but then the next person you take after Boogie is Jimmer for that, and Boogie's automatically pissed that they wasted a pick on a white dude, and then apparently decides that he's going to make it his mission to bully him for the first like three months of the season to the point that Jimmer couldn't even fucking hit water he fell out of a, a boat. No, granted, I don't think Jimmer was ever going to be a star like he was in college. It's way different in college than it is in the pros. Um, you know, between the zone defenses and all that stuff and the system systematic the systems and how, how they differ plus being in certain conferences, you don't have to be as athletic. And that's what made Jimmer so good where he played. Not that the Mountain West is a joke, but you know what I mean? And um but yeah, just for it's, years it's it been a shit show. It's just it's... been a shit show. And the the weird thing is like for most of my like growing up when I was younger the Kings weren't terrible, and then they were, like, the best team in the league, and they got absolutely screwed out of a title because the refs decided, the league and the refs decided that they needed the Lakers in the finals instead of them. They blew that series in 2 3 Weber tears his ACL, and it was just downhill from there. And, um, you know, they made the playoffs a couple more times after that, but it was just – they had this really – fun, exciting team with Bibby and Weber and Peja and Vladi Divox and Doug Christie and all these guys, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Jackson, six man of the year. And it was like, cool. They had this young, fun team and they're going to be there for a while. And it was just gone like that. It was just blinking. You miss it. And like, that's how the NBA can be. It just, just disappears in a second. And, you know, they made the playoffs a couple more times over the next three or four years i think 06 was the last time they made it i believe yeah we, it wasn't yeah. a good team i the last team i remember them having was like it was the 05 team and i think it was like brad miller and maybe kevin martin was on that team uh because people forget that's where he got to start and like i don't even know who else was was there and all i remember is the sonics beat them pretty easily in round one and then that same team ran it back the next year, got swept, and that was that. And then they've just been fucking dog shit ever since. And it's so it's nice. It's 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 good for them. Um, 
you know, they almost got moved to Seattle a couple times, all this stuff. So I would just like for the Aaron Fox and Sabonis because they're two of my favorite players. Um, but I agree with you. And I think another team along those same lines who killed it, I think Utah has got to be in this discussion too. As much as I don't like the Jazz, as much as I hate their fans because they're a bunch of fucking douchebags and, you know, don't get half the shit that Philly fans get, even though they should get more. Um, and I wasn't a big fan of the team that they had assembled. I'm not, a, as we know, I, I'm not a big Donovan Mitchell fan. Uh, Gobert, I don't understand how he won all his defensive player of the year awards. And then out now everyone, like, it's like the Harden paradox where everyone's like Harden, Harden, Harden. Now all they want to do is talk shit, especially since he's a sixer. Like Gobert, everyone's like, oh, Rudy he does this. And then it's like the playoffs look like shit. And then everyone would get amnesia for nine months and start talking about him. Like the playoffs never happened every year. Um, he stole a defensive player of the year award from Ben Simmons. And that's the only nice thing we'll ever hear me say about Ben Simmons anymore. And I just, I hated that way that was constructed. I liked Quinn Snyder as a coach. So I felt like I hated that he was being wasted there. Yeah. I, weren't there rumors? The Sixers. I, I was going to say there were rumors for a little bit that like, maybe they would swap out the Sixers would swap out Brent Brown and go after Quinn Snyder. And then even, I would love, I would love it. Even this past off season after he like resigned or whatever from Utah, there were the rumors that Doc was going to go to LA to, to go take the Lakers job. And then Quinn was going to come to Philly. Um, and yeah, Utah this year for as much as it's like an Island of Misfit Toys type team, they're mm-hmm. still good, man. They're chippy. Will Hardy already looks like a great coach. And he reminds me, this is very, a very surface level comparison, but Brad Stevens in those early Celtics years, just the way that he's gotten these guys to like buy into playing in a system and just move like moving the ball around on, on a team like this. It's very easy to get locked into. I got to get my bag. I got to look after myself. Let me just play ISO ball and take all these shots, but no, how do I get out? How do I get out of here as fast as possible? Kind of yeah, deal. Exactly. And they haven't done that. They've, they've bought in. And they've kind of bought into the point of like, all right, well, like no one believes in us. So why don't we just buy in now and have it so that like, we can just be this team. Like you said, this Island of Misfit toys that everyone doesn't want to believe in us. And they start at what, like 10 and three or something. And they fall back to earth. They're like 18 and seven, like, like they're, they're, you know what I mean? Like they're like 18 and 14 or whatever. But that said, you know, they, they're still fun. Jordan Clarkson, who is probably bound to end up being just one of these guys who will be like a heat check guy on a, on a title team somewhere down the line. Um, I'm trying to think of like who a good comparison for him would be that eventually he finds his way onto like, of like a, a legit title contender. Like I wouldn't mind him on the Sixers. I just think they'd probably have to give up a little bit too much that I, you know, we don't have anymore. Um, I feel I feel like he's destined for like the Lou Williams, Jamal Crawford type. There you role. go. Thank thank you. But I'm thinking yeah. of like someone maybe who like on like I don't want to say like Eddie House because he wasn't ever really like that guy on this on that Celtics team. I'm trying to think of like a player. I guess a Bobby Jackson would be a good comparison from back mm-hmm. in the day for those Kings teams or something like that. Somebody like a Bonzi Wells, but he was a starter, but someone who just can come in. And there's there's the whole have a game or so a series where it's just like, yep, that was the Jordan Clarkson game, that series where he dropped 25 with like 10 boards and two steals and five assists or whatever. And it took the load off of, you know, Embiid or it took the load off of John Moran or, you know, and it helped them. Um, honestly, I think actually the Suns are a team that could use him greatly. Oh, my God. Phoenix. They yeah. could really use his scoring right now, and and once they get healthy, they could really use him for their bench unit. I think it'd be a great help, especially if you're going to rely on Cameron Payne. It would take a lot of the ball handling and um, you know playmaking responsibilities away from Cameron Payne. Not saying that Jordan Clarkson's the best at that because he definitely had a reputation at one point for kind of being a bonehead himself. I think mm-hmm. he's maybe fixed that a little bit, but I think that. Um, you do that and it, it could go, it could definitely go a long way in helping alleviate some of their issues. 
and, you know, keep them afloat until they get the two cams back, until Booker gets healthy, until they figure out what the hell is going on with Jay Crowder, if he's ever going to play or not again. Um, but, yeah, I think everything Utah did, classic Danny Ainge, definitely panned out. And I think along with the Kings, that, that they're two of the organizations who really did had, – had a very positive offseason – to set them up for the future. And like I said, even to go back to the Memphis thing, getting rid of the Anthony Melton, getting something for it. One of the reasons I, I was saying that like they might, they probably don't miss him as much is because they had the depth, but I was thinking there and I was watching, like I said, that David Roddy doing his thing. And it's like, what kind of irritated me about it was just like, how come the Sixers can't do that? How come we can't draft these players and develop them? You know, like, do you have faith that Jaden Springer is ever going to be anything? Because I don't. No, the greatest hope that we have is Matisse Thibel and Paul Reed. Those are basically the only hopes and, that we have. And they're Mount cooked Mount at this point too now, right? Like Matisse either gets like 20 minutes or none. Paul Reed, for all the, like the love that the, the Sixers fans had for B-Ball Paul, <laughs> I, I, I kind of think that uh, he is just – I think he's destined to just be an eight-man, eighth-man off the bench – um, his shot just never came in. Yeah, he could be like a good defender, but people just know what he is now. And, you know, like Sean Marion could at least like, – that's your best hope is that he somehow became like a Sean Marion type. But Sean yeah. Marion could still knock down a corner three. Like, B-Ball Paul can't even hit a fucking 20-footer. I just think for whatever reason the Sixers don't – like rely on the young guys and we've gotten so wrapped up in like this is our window, this is our window that it's led to this huge like George Steinbrenner like need to spend money on free agents like Montrez mm-hmm. Harrell and it's like I would <clears throat> why not give those minutes to Paul Reed I don't know but that's just that's just me but anyway but that, and that's how you stay but that my the be real quick and I'll close it up we'll yeah close eyes but that's how you stay competitive for years is that you keep building through the draft even if you're getting picks in the 20s like you Tyrese Maxey has proven <laughs> that a pick in the 20 can turn into something real so I I just yeah, no, you know sure. what I mean I just I don't know why we skate our draft picks so easily and just give up on it I think it's also been a weird timing thing with like certain drafts are really deep and other drafts just aren't and so because the Sixers have had lower picks sometimes it just doesn't look it doesn't look well. And then you take a swing on a guy like a Markel Fultz or a Ben Simmons. And it's like, fuck it. <laughs> like, that's all you can say is just fuck. Um, but so this second tier, this is the Bambi on ice, cautiously optimistic tier. So these are the, the moves that I'm like, all right, good signs, but the red flags are a little bit redder and waving a little bit higher than others. I'll list them. Donovan Mitchell to the Cavs, Jalen Brunson to the Knicks, the Hawks trading for DeJounte Murray, the Mavericks trading for Christian Wood, and the Nets not moving Kyrie Irving, which has been kind of the big turnaround in the last few weeks. Uh, Which direction do you want to go in first? trying to think of which one of those let's say let's just let's get the hawks out of the way fair enough that's fair i mean the good thing for the hawks is that with these reports that trey young wants out if i'm looking at it from atlanta's perspective thank god that we traded for Dejounte murray because if trey young really does want out at least we do have an insurance policy of a, a point guard that we still have a good roster and we can still contend at like that four, five, six seed level. And then maybe we could do something else with what we get in return with Trey to parlay that into another superstar down the line or something like that. So, I mean, with, with Trey Young, it's just like he's so ball dominant. And it seems like he's kind of hit this point where he's just refusing to change the way that he plays. He's taking the same amount of shots pretty much. His shooting is atrocious, and it just seems like he does. He's not um, 
He's just not willing to like pass it to his wings. It's just either a three or a lob to a, to a big man or a floater. And it's like, it's Rasilla. I don't know. Did you listen to the late to the Rasilla podcast where he was talking about the, the Trey young stuff earlier this week? Mm-mm. No. His, so I'll try and paraphrase, uh, yeah, paraphrase, summarize. Um, his point was if, if this really is rival executives or if this is coming from Trey Young's camp, he he said, if you if I'm the Hawks, trade Trey Young now. Cause it's just he's being empowered, but he's still miserable at the same time. And it's just not a that's not a good dynamic. And also and also the fact that there are no quotes coming out supporting Trey Young is like really damning. It's really and also the history of like we talked about John Collins. There are reports that John Collins was pissed at Trey Young not passing the ball to him and sharing it with his teammates. I just think when I see Atlanta playing with Murray on the floor, they just seem more invested and engaged. Mm-hmm. Whereas Trey Young just turns three guys into bystanders and spectators. And so it's just not beneficial uh in the long run. So that's why I'm optimistic that if this Trey Young thing does go down in flames. I'm optimistic that Murray can be the guy similar to what he was in San Antonio, but because Atlanta's roster is much higher quality around him compared to what he had in that last year in San Antonio, that he could be even better than what he was in that all-star year last year. You know what I mean? And I think the thing, the thing with Trey Young is how far are you ever actually going to get with him? Like, they can keep pointing to that 2021, like, Eastern Conference Finals run. But in reality, that was Simmons growing a vagina and, and losing his manhood and not being able to hit a fucking layup like a, like a five-year-old in, you know, GYEC. That was Doc Rivers being a terrible coach. And that was none of our supporting cast helping out Joel so, yes, while the Hawks still had to make baskets and show up and do what they had to do, like, most smart NBA fans and, you know, people who cover the league remember, like, yeah, you were down 20 three different occasions. And if it wasn't for fucking Doc Rivers, Ben Simmons, and Ben Simmons, and the supporting cast just blowing it, then, like, you would have been out of that – that series would have been over in five games. But yeah. it, it wasn't, and and the Sixers fucked it up, and they blow it, and you know multiple times, and but there was no reason they ever should have been there. So that's like this false note that they gave themselves, of like, oh, well, we made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, we're only like one step away, and it's like, with what though? Like, you know, like he is essentially a softer version of AI in that he needs to have the ball twenty four seven. He can't really pass it. He doesn't know how to play well with others, but, and he just, he's, but like, he's just, unlike AI, he doesn't play defense. He doesn't die for loose balls. Like, at least AI had that in him. He had that man in him where he had that dog in him where he would jump for loose balls and he, he would play hurt. He, hell, he would show up half in the bag and go and drop a 40 burger on someone and it didn't matter, you know? Like, Trey Young doesn't have that. Trey Young needs everything to be perfect. And all, all of it, all the surroundings to, you know, acquiesce to his needs. And I, you know, like you said, I, you know, that how they were still the saying, apparently, like, get rid of him now. And I agree. Get rid of him now. Because the longer you hold on to him, the longer he keeps submarining his, like, value and what he has, and he continues to develop these, um, like generally just bad, selfish habits, then there, there's going to be less and less people out there that think they can break him. Now, I don't even know who would want him, who could take him, what he could be, but there's somebody out there that's stupid. There's always somebody out there stupid enough to get it. The problem is wherever Trey goes, he's going to think he's the guy. And so – I think that will scare a lot of people off that that want to maybe bring him in as the second guy or, you know, one A and one B. And 
it's going to take a lot of convincing. Whether he has that mentality, I don't know. But it seems like ever since this kid first learned to dribble basketball, he's basically been told by his parents and every coach and every team he's ever had, like, without you, Trey, we'd be nothing. It was like that in his high school. It was like that at Oklahoma for the one year. And it's been like that ever since he got into the league. And, you know, I just – if I was a Hawks fan – I'd have a hard time cheering for him and I'd have a really hard time believing that we are set up for the future as long as he's the focal point of this team. And I've, I am the Hawks GM and I can find someone that wants to give me something for him, especially something that's positive. I would, like you said, I just jump all over it, hand the keys over to DeJounte and it probably, as you said, would improve morale. And then you could stop, trying to find somebody to take John Collins like you have been for the last three years. Maybe Capella comes back. You have another bunch of other young guys. You know, you still got Inekwu, or however you say his name, the Auburn kid, right? You still Okongwu. got AJ Okongwu, thank you. Yeah. You still got um, AJ Griffin, who's been a pretty decent draft pick. And hell, Capella, you know. And maybe if, if Trey Young does get out of the equation, maybe that gives DeAndre Hunter more probably playmaking opportunities that he hasn't really had a chance to show. He's been very disappointing in my opinion. He, oh, absolutely. He was supposed to be this big thing. And I feel like, like I'm like, I play fantasy basketball and the Andre Hunter is like the kind of guy that you would think would be a prime candidate, even though he hasn't been like, he's not like lighting it up on the score, like scoring like 20 points a game, but he's kind of like Andre Karolinko. And that he always has his hands in every facet of the game. That was his appeal. That's what he was modeled as coming out of college. What everyone said, he can do this and he can do that. He can do all these things. And like, so you'd look at Andre Karolinko and you'd be like, yeah, well, he only averages like 13 points a game. It's like, yeah, but he also averages nine rebounds and eight assists and four steals and two blocks. And when you add all those up, that's just as much as somebody who averages 33 points a game and three assists. Yeah. So like, that's what make would make him like and in fantasy basketball, I can tell you right now in my league, he ain't nowhere to be found. He's sitting on the waiver wire and ain't no one ever looking at him. And I know fantasy basketball, like any fantasy sport, isn't a good way to correlate it, but that just tells you everything that DeAndre Hunter they thought they were getting out of him is not lived up to it. And I think Trey Young is a big reason why, just like you said. And I agree with that. And if the Hawks are smart, they get rid of him. And I think it could change that team's dynamic. And if they get something like another scorer, but like a scorer who wants to play, hell, ask, call Utah. Hey, you want a superstar for this new rebuild? Have Trey. Here's the thing. Danny Ainge could look at it this way. Hey, I had, you know, something similar like this in Isaiah Thomas. I, I made a winner out of it. Or, fuck it, we just let him shoot 30 times a game. He continues to make us worse. And we're back in the win banana C stakes or whatever else they want to be. Maybe they go get Jordan Clarkson or somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. A pick or one of the five picks or 5,000 picks that Utah has. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Atlanta season swings around. And now there's someone that could cause a little bit of trouble in the second round. Yeah. No, it's definitely a possibility. But speaking of weird team dynamics, the Brooklyn Nets, <laughs> I don't know how, but this team is somehow back into the top three. Easter Conference C contention. They're 10 now in their last 10 games. They're the number one in points per game and three point percentage in the last 10 games. And Kyrie Irving has somehow put up 30 plus points per game or 30 plus points in five of the last eight. And haven't heard a peep. Everything's been going well. And all of a sudden, KD's in the MVP conversation. And <clears throat> This is what we thought this pairing could be at full strength and full power, and especially when Kyrie isn't allowed into his Twitter. But <laughs> I, it's the question for me, the reason why I have doubts about this and put it in the second tier is, will this hold together by the playoffs? Will this all be flowing and everyone will be healthy and team morale is going to be high? Is all that going to come together by the time playoffs hit, and even through the playoffs, if they do make a deep run. Because after during that sweep against Boston, 
KD and Kyrie just looked miserable outside of that what game one or game two when Kyrie just took over and got in the garden. Other than that, it, it just looked miserable. And and maybe Jacques Vaughn kind of changes that dynamic a little bit and his coaching maybe is different in the playoffs by compared to Steve Nash last year. But I mean, the Nets pretty much held firm, didn't trade him. They easily could have blown everything up, but they didn't. And now they're back to being one of the top three teams in the East and could possibly be making another deep run and leapfrogging Milwaukee to be in that top two conversation with Boston. So I don't know how this happens, but it does. And so the NBA is just weird like this. And if I'm Brooklyn, I got to at least let this thing ride out for another season and then deal with Kyrie in the off season again. Yeah, you know what I think the shitty thing about this is, man, is that people are going to look at this and be like, man, Steve Steve Nash really was doing a bad job. Oh, and yeah. I don't think that's true at all. I honestly think it's that he has a, it was a very toxic locker room. He clearly wasn't putting up with Kyrie and Katie's baby ass bullshit. They found out right away that he wasn't going to just let them run the team like they thought they were going to get the opportunity to do like they were doing with Kenny Atkinson. And the second that they oh, – any little bit of friction came up, Kevin Durant and his true I'm a little baby-ass bitch form was like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and, t- and tell them either trade me or get rid of Nash and create a problem where there wasn't a problem. And then when – this way, it also gives him an out. So while all this Kyrie shit's going on and he knows that there's going to be some issues on the court, it's going to – he knows that no one's going to look at him. They're just going to look at Steve Nash and be like, oh, Steve Nash was the problem. Well, no, it was Kyrie. And, yes, maybe Steve Nash didn't have the best coaching acumen, but I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to put any blame at his feet. If anything, I thought he got a raw deal. He kind of from day one went in there, and it seemed like Durant and Kyrie didn't ever really want to play for him. And, you know, he is the second coach that that duo is, you know, submarined. And, yeah, they've won 10 in a row. They look good. Durant has been, like, beast mode lately. He's, like, you know, 2013, 14, Thunder. Like, that's how good he's been. Um, He's averaging, like, 29 a game, all that good stuff. But, um, you know, like you said, the the, the one thing is can this – let's see if this can last until the playoffs. But the second thing for me is let's see what they can do in the playoffs because that was a complete choke job against the Celtics last year. They were in game one, and then just as that series went on, the Celtics just increasingly, you know, had their way in that series, bitched them up, did everything they wanted. People don't want to don't want to admit it, but Durant is a choke artist in the playoffs. He has does not have a great resume in the playoffs. He had the one year in the Thunder where he took them to the finals and what was kind of a West that was banged up. um, Kobe was hurt. If I remember, yeah, Kobe got hurt, if I remember correctly, or was, or that was the the white, so the the white Howard shit show year or something like maybe it's a match, something like that. Um, Dallas never really, did anything to try and run I'm, it back. But yeah, I'm just I, I'm just I'm not gonna say that a guy who has two titles and is a finals MVP is a choke artist. I just don't know if well, I'm willing to go that think far. about how he got those titles. He had to go to a super team where he had Steph Perry and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and one of the greatest coaches of all time and Steve Kerr and one of the greatest organizations of the last two decades who did everything to make sure he could win. But when he is on his own, he does not get it done. But he gets bailed out because people put the blame on everyone else. All oh, was Harden's fault that the Thunder lost in 2012. All oh, the reason that the Thunder never won with, J- with Durant and Westbrook is because Russ can't share the ball. It's all Russ. Russ is the reason they lost in 2016. Actually, no, it was Russ and Durant. And if you go back and look, Durant was way worse than Russ was in those series. And I fucking hate when people say that, that Durant never gets any of the blame. It's such fucking bullshit because he was 10 times worse. He disappeared in those last three games, didn't do anything about it. Regardless, I like last yeah. year, he wilted again in the playoffs, shrunk like a little baby. 
like did nothing. When the second that any adversity comes his way, he sh- he shrivels down and shrinks. And I just I with with last year specifically, it felt like he was forcing a lot of elbow jumpers, and part of that is on Steve Nash for not making any adjustments because it felt like they were just running the same like KD on the baseline. Nick Claxton run a screen and then KD's going to curl around that and take an, an 18 at free throw line jumper on the elbow or at the free throw line every single time. But what have we, what have one thing we have learned is that they can say that's all on the coach, but the players just don't have to listen. You know, that they could just be doing their own thing. So it might be a little bit of Nash, might be a little bit of the players. I think they stopped giving a shit until, about what Nash said before the playoffs last year and probably by the time that they, they got to game three, it was just Kyrie and Katie like, all right, we're just going to do it our way. Fuck you. We don't care. Yeah. It was, and, like, it was like the, uh, the substitute teacher. You kind of mm-hmm. think it's like the kids assign the substitute teacher and they think he's going to be the cool sub. And then he starts putting his foot down and it's like, Oh shit. Oh, fuck you loser. Like leave us alone. That's essentially what it was. They came to Brooklyn with this idea that they were going to get to do and say whatever the hell they wanted. And the second they had any little bit of adversity against them, it was, they went crying to the press, trade me. I went out, get rid of them, do this. Get it's like, just be a fucking man sack up and just go and win the game. You know, instead of just constantly trying to go to the media, cry like a little bitch and find reasons as to why it's not your fault. That's all Durant has ever done, I feel like, in most of his career. It's just talk about how it's how he got screwed or this was this and somebody was against them and blah, blah. For all the talent that that guy has, he spends way more time bitching and moaning about stuff. And if he just went out and played the game, and I'm not, when I say that, I'm not being like, shut up and dribble. Yeah. You can have a voice. You can say what you want. But I just feel like he does more – He he spends more time talking to the media and bitching about – how it's unfair to him or how he got screwed or something instead of just going out there and taking care of business. Well, speaking of taking care of business or people who don't Donovan Mitchell to the Cavaliers is the next transaction that we will review. Um, The Cavaliers are sitting in the four seed 111 points per game, which is only 26th in the league, which kind of surprised me given how on fire Darius Garland and, both him and Mitchell have been pretty much throughout the whole season, but the defense is very good. The Cavs only allow 105 points per game uh, from opponents. So with this being one of the biggest trades of the off season, and this is the Cavs basically saying we're going all in with our young core of Mobley, Allen and Garland. We're going to have Mitchell be the explosive firecracker basically to kind of alleviate Garland. I think this is a good success so far, at least coming in up on the midway point through the season. The Cavs are looking like they could get home court advantage throughout the first round. It's going to be a tough battle between them, the Sixers, um, and how that, that those top three teams shake out with the Bucks, the Nets, uh, and the Celtics. So with the Cavs, I'm like, this is probably the best role for Donovan Mitchell. Just go get buckets and alleviate the, the pressure off of the real playmaker and then at the same time defensively i think he's been very much more energized to be in a winning situation which has kind of said like oh thank god like finally i can be i'm on a team where like i don't have rudy gobert behind me bitching and moaning and complaining that a guy like just went by me because that's just emotionally and mentally like fatiguing it's like if a coworker just every day was just on your ass about you miss this number, you miss this deadline or whatever, like you would get sick and tired of that fucking person very easily. So I think he was in that kind of situation. So for him now, I think this is a really good role and Cleveland made the right idea or made the, the smart move. And I don't think that this is necessarily going to hurt them long-term. Um, and it's, it's kind of scary. I'm kind of scared of the Cavs. I'm not going to lie. But I do have concern about their front court offense or yeah, front court offense. Um, I think they need a little bit more. That offensive number of points per game, it kind of scares me, especially when you're talking about competing with like Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, um, even when Harden has his great nights. That's the only issue that I would have about the Cavs moving forward. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely panned out. I think it's. I think when in Utah, it was both ways because as much as Rudy would bitch about, hey, you know, I'm sick of cleaning up your guys' laziness, Mitchell had no problem constantly calling out Rudy for shit too. Um, it's another reason why I'm not a big fan of his. He's another one that it's just like constantly, you know, like like the whole rookie of the year thing. Oh, why I should be winning that award. Like, dude, it's the rookie of the year award. Like, calm the fuck down. <laughs> this isn't the MVP award or the finals MVP. Like, let's 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 put into perspective what you're fighting over, first of all. Malcolm Second Brogdon all, won rookie of the year for Joel Embiid's rookie year. That shows a career trajectory that can take place. Right. Tyreek Evans won a rookie of the year. Yeah. What did he do after that? Nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, but, um, yeah, I, I think this has definitely been one of the more positive trades. It's it's freed up Garland and in the sense that he isn't just constantly relied on now to make all the offensive decisions because, as you saw with Cleveland last year, towards the end, like, not only was it injuries, but it really was just, like, if Garland – didn't create something it was just like all right well then what are we going to do now because I, I didn't drive or i didn't go on a pick and roll and then essentially you just would boil break down and then it would be either him chucking up a shot or throwing the like passing the ball to someone that they heave a three with like a second left on the shot clock so now with 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 mitchell there as much as i'm not a big fan of him like i don't deny his ability I just don't think he's as good as he thinks he is or most people think he is. I think he's a fine second or third option, more third than second, in my opinion. I just really don't think he's as good. He's not as good as a three-point shooter as he thinks he is. Um, He's not as good as an athlete as he thinks he is or other people think he is. He really isn't. He's sneakily slow. He doesn't have that jump that everyone, like, wants to think when, you know, he, he, first of all, Second of all, he gave him, he nicknamed himself. And anyone that nicknamed himself, and especially when you nickname yourself Spida, like that's a flag right there. Like, all right, Spida. Well, when I look at your highlight reels and you can barely throw down a dunk, and you know, but but you're sitting here trying to act like you're the most athletic shooting guard in the league, regardless. He's been a great addition. Like I said, he's helped freed up Garland. They're not as reliant on Karis Levert as like, because I think this is what they thought Karis LeVert was going to do for them. And now Karis LeVert can kind of just be that random guy that every so often goes off for like 25, like every like sixth or seventh game or something like that, you know. And um, it definitely helps share the load. And then, like you said, it's just the front court at that point. How do they get Mobley and Allen involved? I don't think Allen's ever going to have a skill set where he has, like, post moves that are just wow you. He, I think he's always going to be way more of, like, a Ben Wallace defensive type guy. Um, but I think that Mobley already has some nice development. He's got an okay outside shot, if I'm correct. Um, he's got some decent post moves that he's got to work on. And, you know, I've admitted it, I've admitted it already in the past. I was way wrong about him. I never thought it would translate. I, I, I thought he would be too soft. And he's really gone out and just been the complete opposite. And as long as they can stay healthy, as long as they have a proper coach and they can develop one or two more guys off the bench like Memphis has, yeah, they could become a real problem in the East over the next five five years or so. Definitely. And uh, last two, I mean, both these teams are in pretty much the same position, the Knicks and the Mavericks. The Knicks getting Jalen Brunson, I think it's a good stepping stone in the right direction. Gives them a point guard. Unfortunately, Julius Randle runs way too many isolations, and I think this team is destined for, like, a very mediocre season. Same thing with Dallas. Like, although Luka put up that 60-point triple-double and it was very impressive, it still reflects how heliocentric that team is around him, and that's the problem is that you need multiple threats. And unfortunately, Dallas does not have a really good supporting cast, including Christian Wood, to really convert and take over a game when Luka doesn't have his shot going or um, Luka isn't getting to the rim or posting up like he normally does. So both those teams, I'm optimistic about their futures, but it's like how that ceiling is not very high. You know what I mean? 
Right. Yeah. They, they, this it's like Dallas is essentially a like when you watch Donch, it's it's like the less it comes off as a less selfish version of Trey Young, but their ball usage rate probably is around the same. The offense completely revolves around just him and what they can do. They run the they have the slowest offense in in terms of possession possession per game in the league. And essentially, like, it was supposed to be this, like, four in, one at, or one in, four out kind of offense with Donchins doing everything. And, you know, when you catch them on the wrong night and it's just Donchins jacking up threes and hitting nothing, it's fucking painful to watch. Now, Christian Wood, I think, has been a solid addition. Um, he's averaging, like, probably like somewhere like 19 and, like, he's- 10 or something like that. He's averaging 17.8 points per game, 7.8 rebounds, 55.1% field goal percentage in 19 games against Western Conference opponents. So huh. that was against the West. I only looked at the West for whatever stupid reason. My brain was like, I'm just going to look at the West like an absolute. Anyway, uh, Christian Wood is averaging 17.4 points per game, eight rebounds, and one and a half assists. See, and that's not bad, you know. He, no, he's never gonna be like he's never gonna be a Mobley or something like that. But he is. If you can, if you they were able to find a second scoring guard or forward, like preferably a small forward, and then he's the third option. I think then they could have some real, some they could be cooking with something. Mm-hmm. But right now they're not. So like Christian Wood is doing everything he can to the best of his ability of what he's the situation he's in. I would love like, for Dallas. I would love for Dallas to go after Duncan Robinson. I think that would be a very good fit, but he still, I think is not, he's not a big enough move. You know what I mean? Like even then, yeah. like, and I know I keep saying his name, but even Jordan Clarkson for them would yeah. be, would, would help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're looking for like a, like, an upgraded version of Spencer Dinwiddie where like it can be another yes. ball handler that can pl- Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can, I see where you're saying another running mate, basically. Okay. Yeah. Like you need, you need a, an option too. And, and why maybe Jordan Clarkson would be a good number two in that situation is because, because Luca does so much that you don't necessarily need like a Jalen Brown type player to go with a Jason Tatum. Like you just need, like you know, like like a a better Spencer did with or Tobias Harris to mm-hmm. go. You know what I mean? Like a, yeah, yeah, someone that's like a little bit below Donovan Mitchell, but a little bit above Tobias Harris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see where you're going. And that. that's where maybe Jordan Clarkson falls in there, and you know they can go get him. Um, you know something, but yeah, it, it's it's not fun to watch. I don't think it has a lot of you know. I think they're another one like the Hawks in 2021. That Eastern or that Western Conference Finals run last year is a fluke. Don't buy into it. Like you can't buy into it. Anyone that thinks like, oh, well, we're only one step away. Like, no, you, you saw what happened the second you had to go up against one of the big boys that wasn't in the middle of a locker room beef between their star center and their head coach. It, it was, you know, it, it's so. They need to – and I I think Cuban's smart enough to realize that. I just – I think he – I think Cuban has always thought that Dallas would be way more of an attraction to players than it has ever been. And they have a real hard time landing these free agents and these big guys. And, you know, the problem with having Luka then is that he's going to drag you to like a seven seed every year if he really wants to. So you're never going to be able to go another real big running mate unless you somehow swing a trade and get 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 move up there. And but then even then comes the whole as we talked about. So it's very boring to watch, and it sucks to say because Luca is one of the better is one of the five best players in the league at the moment. It's incredible to watch when he does when he like hat really has it going, but it's just they're just going nowhere. As far as the Knicks, um, 
ironically, the running mate that the Mavericks had now is on the Knicks because of some tampering and Brunson, I guess, just didn't want to play in, in Doncic's shadow anymore. He's been much better than I think most a lot of people would have thought. I, I probably even me. I, I know he's I, obviously living in the Philadelphia area. We know how good Jalen Brunson is. We yeah. watched him for, for three years at Villanova. He was a stud. From day mm-hmm. one, he was a stud there. So I'm happy to see he's succeeding, even if it is with one of our, you know, big conference rivals. Um, so that said, uh, yeah, like you said, like Julius Randle, like used to trade, got to go down, like, cool. Oh, Julius Randle's back because he's scoring 20 plus a game. Yeah. He's also doing it on like 30 shots and hogging the ball and mean mugging his way down the court after every goddamn fucking foul. Like I, I, that's, this is why I can't stand Julius Randle because he's one of those players that thinks he's tough has to like try and act tough after everything he does and if you have to do that then you're not hard i'm sorry julius but just because you drilled a three in front of a guy that was falling over it doesn't mean you have to walk back down the court like like you just got done and like pumping iron in the yard like no man just fucking walk back down the court and man up on defense like you don't have to fucking make a face every time you hit a shot you don't you know like you're not draymond green you yeah, I just, I just, I never, I just can't stand him for half of that shit. And I think, like, they, they went on a little run. They're not, they're a yo-yo team right now. They, they just lost their fifth straight now. Um, Brunson, I guess he was fine. He did leave the Sixers game a little injured on Sunday, but I guess he's been okay. Um, so we'll see, but I just don't think they have enough. R.J. Barrett is still way too inconsistent. I think Thibodeau. I, I just don't. I just he's don't not ever the guy. Think, he's not yeah. the guy. He's, he's just not the guy somebody. to lead that team. He his style is so out of date. He's he's coaching like it's two thousand and eight when it's two thousand and twenty two, uh, and I just then I, I don't know. Um, but hey, don't worry, Knicks fans, because according to the ringer, Joel Embiid's going to be a Nick any day now. So, um, oh, wait, no, that's just this weird fucking stalker fetish that they have that's on the like fringe of restraining order at this point. But I'm pretty sure Bill Simmons has basically just told every single one of his employees that, hey, just make sure you make a mention that Joel Embiid's going to leave the Sixers any day now and wind up in New York because he's. Because that's where Worldwide West is, and all those guys, and he's one, he's part of their agency. It's like, no, he's not. Like, shut the fuck up. So I don't know. They're that's another fair. team. They're that's caught fair. between a rock and a hard place because they have some pieces, but they don't have enough pieces. Like, what is Obi Toppin going to do? What is it? You know, it's just there are so many people. Like, what is Emmanuel quickly? Like, and I the Knicks because of who they are as a franchise, because of where they play because of their arena, everything like that, they have this mindset that they need to constantly be a contender. And even when they aren't, don't have the pieces to be one, they trick themselves into thinking they are one. When if they make the top six, that's a miracle. I'm sorry. And they no, are one of the like, top six teams in the East is a miracle. It's like the Chicago Bulls from last year. It's like you, Pretty you, much. you think that you're better than you actually are. And then you go all in, and then it's the Armageddon doomsday of oh my god, we're paying all these old guys this much money, and we don't have this this draft pick and this draft pick, and then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, what do we have to look forward to? Do we have to blow this thing up already? Um, and then you're but I at least like forward. Chicago's roster better than New York's. I think New uh, York. I I, 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 th- I like New York's roster build up because it's got some length, it's got quickness. Uh, McBride has been kind of shooting the lights out from time to time. Um, I just think that they don't have the right coach to unlock that full personnel. I think that's what's really holding them back. Like, wait, McBride. Um, you mean Grimes? Yeah, Grimes, not McBride. Yeah, bench warmers, all the same. Uh, yeah. but I think that they need the right coach. And if I'm like, if I'm Sam Cassell, I know this is probably a bad thing to put out into the universe. 
I'm kind of eyeing that next job a little bit, just keeping a side eye, just like, you know, if that ever comes up, I'm not going to not going to say no right away or hang up the phone. Right. Like, can you imagine what Sam Cassell could do for RJ Barrett or even take Jalen Brunson to another new level? Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe the Knicks decide, hey, maybe Julius Randle, we capitalize on this high bounce back year. and Maybe this is the year to move them or something like that. So I would, if I was the Knicks, I'd absolutely do it. If I could find a buyer, I mean, and, and people might be like, what, why, what's all the Sam Cassell love? He's never had a head coaching job, blah, blah, blah. Like as a Sixers fan, the reason we love Sam Cassell is because he never stops coaching. He doesn't care who you are, what you've done and where you are in this league. If you watch a Sixers game, he literally, after every timeout when Harden's on the floor, the first thing he does is he gets up off that bench, he finds where Harden is, and he is sitting there in his face, not in a bad way, but in a coaching way, trying to be like, and you can just tell, like, what did you think about that? What were you thinking there? What you, and Harden, of all people, is responding. Yeah. All people, Harden's like, you can see them having a dialogue. And the fact that he was able to get through to James Harden in year 12 or whatever – shows you the kind of respect that these players have for him and what he could do and necessarily what he might be able to do if he gets a franchise with a with a proper roster build. Exactly. Um, so last tier, this is the sound the alarm, oh my God, what have we done tier? And it's only right that we start this tier with the Rudy Gobert trade. <laughs> the ghost of David Kahn. The ghost of David Kahn has continued to haunt the Minnesota Timberwolves. And this has somehow been worse than I could have possibly imagined. The Timberwolves are sitting at 11th in the West coming into tonight. They finished as the 10th seed last year without Rudy Gobert, and they still had Jared Vanderbilt and a whole boatload of draft picks on top of that. And Anthony Edwards was much happier um, and eating less Chick-fil-A probably. Uh, but Wait, Minnesota, they, were the ten, they were the 10th seed? Because that's what that was that epic – playoff series last year the play-in series last year wasn't it when didn't they finish as the 10th seed and then they went through the play-in tournament and um i thought they were they they got the seventh seed did they get the seventh seed hold on that's what they ended because memphis was the two seed but i thought they were always the seventh okay seed. i got that wrong minnesota was the seventh seed i got that wrong i got that wrong my bad um yeah, it was Minnesota was the seven, and then it was eight New Orleans, nine Clippers, ten Spurs. That's right. That was the weird San Antonio year. Um, oh, yeah, because there's no way that they could have seven seed if they started in the ten hole. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, either way, they still have – that even proves my point more is that they have gotten – way worse. <laughs> Anthony Edwards looks like he does not want to be involved in this team at all. If there was an if there was a a body language doctor, he would be he would be filled with Minnesota Timberwolves patients because this is this team is terrible body language. It seems like no one likes Gobert. Cat being out maybe the best thing because Nas Reed of all people is shining. So like if I'm Minnesota, I'm like, "Oh dear god, what have we done? What the fuck have we done? Like Jared Vanderbilt could have actually contributed deeply, like mm-hmm. a lot on this team as a way. Beasley defender. could have. Hip, most of the guys they got rid of could have. And the best part is the one guy they should have got rid of, D'Angelo Russell, is still on that team. We said Madness. this. Everyone said this. Anybody who covers sports, whether professionally or, you know, and, and the way that we, we, we sit here and, and talk on your podcast, the second it happened, we all were like, what the fuck are they thinking? What are they thinking? I literally, I remember getting on this podcast, talking to you and being like, David Kahn must haunt those offices. And it must just be like some sort of like the second you step in, he like comes into your body, like into your soul, like he possesses you. And it's just like all good thoughts you had prior. <laughs> oh, you know what would be a good idea? Let's trade four picks for Rudy Gobert and all of our bench players. Yeah, that'll make us a contender. Wait, what? <laughs> it's just absolutely maddening to think about. And it's like, I just, 
It didn't make sense at, at the time when it happened. It didn't make sense two weeks after it happened, two months after it happened, and two, you know, two months into the season, it makes even less sense. They are just nowhere near the playoffs. They don't have their fucking pick, so they can't even be bad enough and pray like, oh, maybe this will t- turn our way and we'll get Victor Wimbanyama. No, you don't even know your pick to get Victor Wimbanyama. Victor Wimbanyama. You're fucked. How does it feel? I wonder how Timberwolves fans feel that they're paying Rudy Gobert thirty-eight million this year, forty-one million next year, forty-three million the year after that, and then a player option, which he is definitely picking up for forty-six point six five million. Rudy when Gobert, he's what, when he's what thirty-six, he can barely play. <laughs> He'll be thirty-three. Um, he's that young. Yeah, he'll be 33 in 2025, 2026 when that player option hits. So that'll be fun when Anthony Edwards basically demands a trade because no oh, fucking way. He's, I don't he's think there. he'll be there by that point. I think he'll be Timberwolves gone. fans must just like honestly Hate just themselves. be like, oh, my God, we finally look like we got a fun team. We got another star player and it's been so long. You know, like we like the Kevin Love, R- Ricky Rubio shit never panned out, and now we finally, and then like, and then we had Cat, but now we finally got Edwards, and he could be our like savior. He doesn't care about where he like he wants to be here. He wants to leave this franchise. You know, we got Cat to go along with them. You know, once Russell's gone, we'll do something. Oh, we made a trade, which was new ownership syndrome. And it was like they were just trying to make a splash after a playoff run. And it was like, oh, we did. Oh, okay. Who did we get? Oh, it's with Utah. Maybe we got Donovan. Oh, we got Rudy Gobert. Okay. Well, you know, it probably didn't cost that much. It cost four first rounders. Oh, every other bench player we had. Uh, Okay. Well, back to sucking for the next decade again. Pretty much. It's just like that poor fan base, you know. Thank God they're a hockey town. But then again, the Wild ain't much better. So uh, who are you rooting for now? Like, the go Twins Gophers. haven't been good in, ha- in half a decade. They're, they're a college town now. It's just go Gophers. Yeah, um, it's, it's pretty much, yeah. Thank God they got uh, P.J. Fleck rowing the boat. That big bull went over Syracuse today. <laughs> that That is a sliding doors uh, event that I wonder about. Is it, what if, Kevin Garnett did figure out a way to buy that franchise. Like, I wonder how much that really changes the trajectory. Of what if you mean? What if what if Glenn Taylor was in a complete fucking cocksucker and screwed him out of it? Well, that goes way before Kevin. Right, Garnett that's what I mean. Buy him. That, like, that's back. all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. If Glenn yeah. Taylor wasn't just a piece of shit and yeah, yeah, and didn't care about that fan base. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. They it'd be <laughs> that is a huge sliding doors moment. Or what if they just decided. Not to trade Wiggins or take on that Russell thing or yeah, I just there's it's so many lot. things. That's a lot. That franchise uh, has made so many boneheaded moves since they drafted KJ in '96. They haven't got a single fucking thing right. It's they the Cleveland really Brown, It's the Cleveland Browns of NBA. Like it's like the only whoa. thing they had got right was the year that they had Cassell and Spreewell together with him. That was the only thing they ever did right for KJ. Yeah, the only much. thing they ever did right for him, and then it immediately fucking bombed in their face after one year, and that was it. And they had to go and trade basically the best player, not basically the best player in franchise history, for nothing. And what did they get out of it? Was Al Hor or Al Jefferson, who didn't even become a real player in the NBA until two teams later. Yeah, yeah, that's the Minnesota Timberwolves story, basically in a nutshell. Uh, last move. To sound the alarm, why the fuck is PJ Tucker getting thirty million dollars to play thirty minutes a game and then get blown by consistently and with virtually zero offense? How many, how many games do you think he has where he has put up double digit point totals? One. Yeah, just one, just one game. In October. I thought it was a trick question. And you were going to say zero. No, no, I wish, uh, but. One game in October against the Washington Wizards. That was it. And what was that? Twelve points. Thirteen. <laughs> Damn. 
<laughs> You're close, close <laughs> on the money. Um, I watched Tucker, and he his his attitude thing is definitely like not like he has an attitude. Like the, the toughness has resonated. Yeah. You can see it, but I can't tell you how many times a game I watch him go like be underneath the basket for perfectly for a rebound and like get the ball and. Like I, I can't just like talk it. Like I have to like demonstrate. So let's hope I don't lose you. Like I did the one yeah. time I stepped away. For Some two prop seconds. comedy. Some like, carrot top. Like uh yeah. Some Gallagher get the watermelon. Like <laughs> I can't tell you how he like got position. He gets it and he goes. Yeah. It goes out of bounds. I'm like where the fuck was that? No Clifford Franklin. Do we need to put some elephant stuff on it? Like the, like some stick them in your hand. Coach, it looked like I just jacked off an elephant. Shut up and get out there. <laughs> like, like I have a I have a family friend. My 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 brother in law's brother in law, John, good guy, really good guy. Played played uh, D three college football back in the day. And he's like, it's D three. I don't care. He's like, he'll be that guy who has like no scruples and will cheat and tell you that he cheated. And he's like, yeah, man. Like back in the day, it was popular to put stick on your hands. He was a D back. Yeah. And he's like, you know, I'm a six foot one white dude. Like even in D three, there's people blown by me. I got to take any advantage I got. And so he said that like, you know, when he was going against really like guys that were a lot better, he would put some stick on his hands. And, you know, my brother-in-law is telling me the story because he's at this game and he's saying that he's up there and they're playing and John gets beat like, gets get, makes up for like cover gets regains his ground the the quarterback thinks he's he's got him on a, the, his receiver on a help like a, a go route john gets back into the picture and like sticks his hand out and just like catches the ball but like no way he should have got it but like kind of like just like stuck his hand out and it was almost like a magnet where the ball just went in and he came down with it and everyone's like oh my god how did i get it well, because he had like a shit ton of stick on his hand. So yeah, he said he so. went to give it to the ref and he's telling his like teammates to come over to like rip it off, rip it off. So his one teammate comes on and rips it off as the refs is standing there and they give the ref the ball and the ref looks at him. He's like, do you have no shame? And he's like, nope. <laughs> he <just walks> away. <laughs> but it's like, what are you going to do? You can't, but like, that's what I feel like PJ Tucker should do is like, they, there should be stick them on his goddamn hand because I think even then he still would bobble it. But like, I, it literally, it's just, how am you're in the NBA? You've been playing the sport for how long of your life, and you still wide open. You can't just go like this and catch the ball. You gotta go. Yeah, he like out of bounds. Sorry, guys. When it's a rebound, he like catches it and then just his brain just breaks and he just like throws it out of bounds. It's like what is off his foot? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's another one. There's a couple things he does like. He steps on the line. I've seen him step on the line a lot. A couple, like, not understand his spatial awareness. And he'll have the ball, and it'll take a dumb step, and it'll be out of bounds. Yeah, but like we said earlier in the podcast, this is for the playoffs, obviously. Hopefully, that shit pays off. And I, I'm – the rationalization that I have used is if P.J. Tucker is playing for the Sixers in that Miami series last year – I think that series turns out very differently than the way it turned out before. Mm -hmm. Now, does he have to play 30 minutes a fucking game? I don't think he does. I think he can figure out some minutes for Matisse Thibel in that situation or some other wing, please. And also, while we're at it, can we look at some wing depth? I cannot. I, I'm out on George Niang. I'm out on him. I'm sorry. I, it's, it's been such a weird, like, I can't deal with 0 for 4 in the first half and then 4 for 4 in the next half. Like, I, we need more consistency. I don't care if he's, like, 2 for 5 every night. I'll take that over this streaky 0 points, 25 the next. It's like, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I, I don't get it, like, how, like, like, he shouldn't be taking six threes in a quarter ever. Like, I like George's, but he's terrible on defense. He's constantly misses rotations. He doesn't block out. He can't recover. And he tries. Like, he, at least he tries. Yeah. But there's so many open looks he gets, and you're like, oh, that should pan, That should work out for a wide open three. And it just turns into a brick. And it's like – and then it's just 
them the other way. And it's like, so granted, he's probably the main reason we won that game on one, like the, the, we held on to that game on Sunday. But he also was a reason that that game was a one possession game for like three minutes and six possessions back and forth because he missed three threes in, in, in the span of six years, missing five shots while the Knicks missed five shots. And then he finally banged one in and then, it, then banged another one in. And it was like, oh my God, the minivan. And it's just like, yeah, the minivan, but the minivan also. This minivan know, is very unreliable. There's too many times yeah. this engine this is minivan broke down breaks on down me. a little bit too much. <laughs> it breaks down. I got to change the tires all of a sudden. It's not, it is not. But a this good is, minivan. this is where, like you said, it comes into, it's like, why can't Matisse get more minutes? And I understand that his offensive game has never has not panned out the way that we hoped. He hasn't really developed a shot, or his shot hasn't got to the point it needs to be. Shake is shaky. He can be really good, and then he can't. Obviously, we finally have given up on the stupid ass cork bonds experiment. Thank fucking God. Um, and like I said, we said earlier, like what is Jaden Springer? I get that he's still young, but you know. Why did we take him then when we took him if it was going to take this much development? Like, I don't understand who told that kid to leave college if he needed this much development. I really don't. I I don't know either. And I think it's a situation where Doc just struggles to find minutes for guys and he doesn't want to fuck up the locker room. And unfortunately, it's like, he knows Matisse is going to be a pro about it. He knows um, Furkan is going to be a pro about it. And so they just he's just trying to figure out this rotation. And it's like, dude, we do not have that many young guys coming through the door anytime soon. And it's just very, like, like you said, what's earlier, our G very- League? Like, how many, how many other teams in this league have developed someone for their G League? Like, have used the G League properly? And as like, much as we hate the Raptors, that's one thing I got to give them credit is their yeah. development. It's great. You know, they, they, it's, it's great. And that's the reason that fucking Jerry Stackhouse is supposed to Vanderbilt basketball back on track. God, has that not fucking panned out? Oh, that's a whole different started on that shit. I have no fucking idea what I'm watching when I watch them every game. It okay. Is, that's a, that's a whole different podcast. Timmy. that's a whole different podcast. But, we'll yeah. Like about. I just, that's a, but this is what we were talking about earlier. It's like, why can't we develop young players? And the G League is a perfect example. Like, why are we not able to develop these guys? I don't know. We'll find out. But thank you all for tuning in to the Black and Blue Pod. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hope you all enjoyed the episode, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you all for tuning in.